going to talk a little bit more about uh, the therapeutic protocols, and I want to talk about the heads that come uh, with the laser and why we have these different heads. And basically, it's for uh, versatility and uh, effectiveness. Um, so the, the head that I use the most often is the large contact head. Okay, This head allows you to compress the tissue, blanch the tissue. Um, you have much less reflection um, because the light's being introduced directly into the tissue instead of in an on off contact fashion. Um, and so these uh, heads for any pathology that I can't see are the heads that I like to use, or these little um, massage ball heads, we call them. Um, you also will get a myofacial trigger point release when you're doing this, so you get a second therapeutic benefit. And then a third level of expertise when you're doing this, and this probably you know, takes a hundred times of doing it, is um, to diagnose what's happening with the patient, how sensitive or how painful they are in that area, or how good does it feel. Same idea as when you're getting a massage and somebody gets into that area that's sensitive, and you're like, oh yeah, right there, that's the spot. The animals will do the exact same thing, but it does take sort of an enhanced level of uh, expertise to be able to um, do that. Why do we have two different sizes of heads, okay? It's mostly because we don't want to be putting lots of energy through this little head. This little head I use infrequently, but say on elbows or carp eyes, small body parts, cats, for six watts or less, you can use this um, small contact head. A large head can be used with any um, power setting, and so oftentimes I'll use this with three or four watts um, if I feel like this size ball is appropriate for the anatomy that I'm treating. So large contact head, zero to 15 watts. Um, small uh, contact head, zero to six watts. We also have the non-contact heads, and those heads are uh, intended for pathology that you can see, so stomatitis, or gingivitis, or otitis, dermatitis. Uh, you stay one to three inches away from the tissue, you move it at one to three inches per second, um, but do not contact the tissue with the non-contact head. One inch is better than three inches uh, as far as I'm concerned, and also one inch per second is better than three inches per second. But again, it just sort of depends on the comfort level um, of the animal. The small non-contact head, I probably use the least frequently of any of them, and um, this should be used with three watts or less of power. Again, because it has the smallest vocal cloud, a lot of energy warms up that treatment area more quickly uh, than the other heads. Um, and a common mistake with this one is to you know, vibrate it in the same place. I think of cat ears in particular, people get very focused on that pathology of the uh, external pinup. And they're vibrating back, but they're not making a full excursion onto and off of the pathologic tissue. And so um, you'll see the cat start to shake its head because it's never allowing that tissue um, to cool down. It's getting a little too warm. So if you notice that, again, make full excursions onto and off of the area that you're treating and use the small contact head with less than um, three watts. And that's something that um, you should be able to be quizzed on and have that at the top of your head. Um, the laser will give you a warning um, anytime you're over three watts that you need to be looking at the appropriate um, size head to be using. So again, um, which head do you use? If you can't see the pathology and you need to get the light into the tissue, you want a contact head. 90% better dosing of that deep tissue with a contact head than with a non-contact head. If you can see uh, the lesion, then you want to be using the non-contact head. So hot spot, otitis, stomatitis. Um, uh, a surgical incision. Now there are cases where you use both. So the two that uh, most commonly come to mind are oral treatments because we'll open the cat's mouth for instance and treat in a non-contact fashion and then we'll switch and do the closed mouth function and do through the intermandibular space and treat through the cheeks and get that external um, or labial gingiva treated as well. Same with otitis. Otitis will um, take you through a two-step treatment. One is superficial so the external pin on the part of the ear that you can see, you'll treat non-contact. And when you're done with that, it'll tell you to go to the deep um, treatment. You'll switch heads, put on the contact head, and you'll treat the uh, vertical and horizontal ear canal and that associated tissue. And this brings up another important concept that when you're treating the tissue, if your lesion is, you know, say, yay, big, two inches by two inches, we don't just treat that two inches. We treat an equal area around uh, the lesion that we see or we suspect. And so um, that's all of the involved tissue. You know, you, if you've ever done surgery, you can notice that the pathology doesn't stop at the margin of the wound. Blood supply has increased, and there's a lot of inflammation in the tissue around the wound. So you want to treat um, in an area um, 
probably equal the size of the wing outside. And that also helps you when you're making these full excursions onto and off of um, the tissue. Uh, okay, so we'll take one more Let's talk about uh, the actual application of the laser therapy. Um, first thing to think about is the positioning of the patient. And how do you position the patient? The answer to that is however the patient is comfortable. Uh, sometimes that's going to be in the owner's arms, sometimes not. Sometimes it can be on the treatment table, sometimes standing up, lying down. Basically what we're trying to do is saturate the affected tissue um, in a uh, repeatable manner. And so um, you'll find, especially on the first visit, um, and especially with younger animals, you know, they're not going to want to just lay down and relax and sort of uh, submit to being treated. Now, I do have uh, three videos that you can look for uh, arthritis treatment, ear treatment, and oral treatment that you can actually observe how the treatments go. But you need to understand that there's not just one right way to uh, administer the treatment. There's sort of an art to applying the laser therapy as well as the science. So you want to stay as close to the science as you can, but realize that you know sometimes the animal will be standing, sometimes they'll be sitting, sometimes they'll be lying down, and you sort of have to work with uh, what the animal is going to tolerate. I think you'll also find that um, you know this is great medicine. You're going to get great results within three treatments. Um, you should be seeing significant improvement, and within six treatments, remarkable improvement. If not, then uh, you need to rethink the diagnosis or rethink the treatment and. Uh, try to understand. You should have 95, 98% um, you know, really satisfactory or um, you know, acceptable results of the treatment. And if not, then um, it calls for reviewing why you might not be um, that successful. Um, the third aspect of it is a client bonding aspect. Clients really love to be present during the laser therapy. Um, most of the time, you give them your animal, they give you their animal, it comes in the back, they don't see what happens, and then the animal gets brought back to them. So usually the owner is present, and we use them to help restrain the animal or calm the animal. As I said, sometimes the owner will actually hold the animal during the laser therapy. Um, but this is sort of a spa-like treatment. Um, I think one of the you know, emphasis in veterinary medicine now is this fear-free veterinary visit where the animal comes in and they don't experience fear or pain or discomfort. And laser therapy and physical therapy in general is um, remarkable in the fact that the animals will really have a different experience at the clinic, and so the owners will have a different experience at the clinic. And you should be able to explain um, to the owner some basics of what is happening. And I usually tell people to do this with their hand, you know, two fingers down, one finger up. What does the laser do? It decreases pain, it decreases inflammation, and it increases healing. That will satisfy, you know, 90% of most clients. And if not, um, you can hand them the iPad with a little um, animation of how laser therapy works, and that can explain it in more detail. The second thing I'll tell them when they say, well, is it just a heating method? Is it just warming the tissue? No, this is not a heating modality. It's a photochemical process. Um, and if you think they're um, able to understand the term of photobiomodulation, that's a more appropriate term, but I think it loses most of our clients. So it's a photochemical process. Oh, okay. What does that mean? Well, it's similar to photosynthesis or vitamin D synthesis. It's light interacting with tissue to cause a chemical change. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Doesn't sound like magic or feng shui or aromatherapy. That sounds like science. So, so what happens in the tissue when that light interacts with tissue? Well, it produces ATP. That's the energy currency of the cell. And if you really want to get advanced, you can tell them it also produces nitric oxide uh, and reactive oxygen species, which are also uh, inflammatory. Mediator. So, um, I think being able to give them some of the science, reassure them that this is, uh, you know, an effective modality used by all the professional sports teams in your area and across the country, um, really getting uh, more use on the human side all the time, um, and the fact that it's in use at all the major uh, veterinary universities uh, across the country, and especially those that are um, really promoting uh, rehabilitation and regenerative medicine. Um, so in any case, that um, I think those things are important to be able to discuss while your your client and your pet are having this uh, experience in your vet clinic. Let's take one more break, and we're going to talk about the actual uh, technique of applying the laser uh, therapy. So get a cord unwound here. There we go. So you have a ten and a half foot long uh, treatment cord, which lets you you know have a lot of freedom away from the laser and still keeping uh, the laser safe. 
all of the um, electronic components are in the laser itself, not in the handpiece, so it's not like your ultrasound head where this is uh, you know, extremely liable. We still don't want to break it, but it's pretty durable. This can even get uh, moist or wet, so if you have animals coming out of a treadmill or uh, even for bathing or grooming, um, so you don't have to worry about that. Try not to get the hands switch wet, but the handpiece itself is fine. So what is the technique that we apply the laser light with? So when I'm doing this, uh, there's a couple things I like to do. First is when I'm lasering, I like to move the handpiece over the tissue without the laser being turned on because I want to see if the animal is sensitive to the contact or not. And then what I'll do is trigger the finger switch uh, once I'm sure they're okay with the contact and add the laser light to that. When I am lasering, I like to have my pinky sort of dragging along the tissue, and I call that the trailing finger technique. And that allows me to get a sense of how warm the tissue is getting in. You know, with darker animals, you're going to feel the tissue uh, get a little bit warmer. With lighter animals, it'll get less warm. Again, that analogy of a dark car in the parking lot versus a light car. And it really doesn't make any difference. You may move the probe slightly faster, but the software will adapt uh, the energy and the uh, wavelengths based on the parameters that you enter into it on the fur coat color and uh, skin color. When we apply this, um, we want to have a little compression of the tissue. So uh, again, I think um, when you first do it, slight compression is fine, but you can actually go to more of a massaging technique as your expertise develops. And uh, the analogy I like to make is just sort of perceive what it would feel like on your own skin or your own neck or your own back. Get that feedback from the animal. What do they like as far as the amount of pressure being applied goes. Once in a while, I have an animal that doesn't want you to touch them. And so you can do this one or two millimeters away. And then once they've uh, tolerated that for one or two minutes, then you can go into contact. So that's a relatively rare situation, but um, it happens once in a while. The contact head lets you uh, push down through the hair and part the hair, uh, compress the tissue, get direct light introduced into the tissue. Um, when you're introducing this, you want to keep the probe perpendicular to the tissue. So you'll be moving it in a grid-like pattern, but as you're coming around, you don't want to be sort of doing a back and forth. You don't want to be see that Amy being at any time. So you want to follow the contour of the limb uh, as you come around with the probe perpendicular. Now, you can see if I was going to do my whole arm, it takes a lot of wrist movement. And this is pretty fatiguing, right? So instead of doing that, I'll... I'll provide the majority of the uh, therapy in a longitudinal direction. And then when I am doing my grid-like pattern, I'll do maybe a third or fourth of the arm this way, and then I'll move to another part of the limb a third that way in that um, cross-hatching um, direction. So I'm not, again, having to go all the way, you know, 360 or 180 or 270. It's just too much work to do it um, that way. You do want to treat any uh, deep pathology from 360 degrees. So if I had an elbow problem, I want to treat 360 degrees around the joint if possible. Now, say in a back, that's not going to be really possible, but I want to treat that back from maybe 270. I even want to get up and aim up into the iliopsoas muscles a little bit, but I can't obviously go through the abdomen and get enough penetration to get that 360. So on backs, I'll sort of um, shoot for 270 degrees of treatment um, around that area. You also want to try to take the area you're treating through a range of motion. So at least two different positions. If you're in three different positions, that's fine. Sometimes the animals will sit for part of the treatment or stand for part of the treatment. So that um, helps you get into a different um, position. Again, look at the videos that we have of uh, the arthritis treatment. You'll see us moving the limb into a couple different positions. Especially on the back leg, you want to get into that medial uh, position and treat um, from the medial aspect um, up towards the pectineus and uh, towards that part of the joint capsule. You know, if you're not getting the results you expect on these hip treatments, sometimes it's because uh, you're not getting that medial aspect. And when dogs come in, they might um, be reluctant or feel vulnerable when you're getting that area the first time or two. So you might have to be patient and say, you know, this wasn't the full ideal treatment the first time, but I could feel the dog relax. And typically they will over subsequent um, therapy sessions just get more and more relaxed and do whatever, uh, let you do whatever you need to do to get that treatment. 360 degrees um, around the joint. This brings up the point also of skin lesions and stuff. Again, when you're treating those, you want to treat beyond the boundaries of the pathology, or the, beyond the boundaries of the visible pathology to treat all of the associated tissue. And um, likewise, this will um, sort of mention this idea of, say you have 
two bad uh, knees. The hips look pretty good, the back looks pretty good. Well, we will still sometimes treat the hips and the lumbar spine because we want to deal with that wind-up pain and those uh, nerve roots that are supplying uh, that chronic pain. And we feel like um, the joints that are not affected as far as what we can see on pathology are being asked to do extra work. So we're looking at the whole animal and the whole limb, trying to treat um, that whole back end of the animal because those bad knees are making that um, dog bear weight differently and um, propulse differently. So keep that in mind as well that um, you're going to get more effective um, outcomes if you're treating the spinal nerve root segments that are associated with the pathology and if you're treating some of those other major joints that are trying to compensate for um, the pathology that you're um, treating as well. Um, when you deliver the dose, um, it's important to deliver the dose that the laser is suggesting. And again, when you start out, just follow uh, the protocols that the laser gives you. As time goes on, if you want to give an increased dose, you could perhaps select a higher weight for the animal on there, or you can go into the operations mode and select a specific dose that um, you want to give to that area. Um, so those are the main uh, principles. You want to move the probe in a grid-like pattern. You want to um, apply a moderate amount of pressure in a massaging-like technique. You want to treat the uh, area from 360 degrees. You want to go beyond the boundaries of the uh, pathology. You want to take the um, limb or the joint through a, a range of motion, if possible. You want to use the contact heads whenever you can't see the pathology. And you want to use the non-contact heads whenever you can see the pathology. And again, there's some cases where there could be a little bit of both. Let's say a TPLO where you want to use the non-contact head right over the incision, and then you want to use the contact head the other 270 degrees uh, around the joint. So again, um, one to three inches per second on the probe. I think when people start out, they tend to go faster, and then as they get more confident and comfortable, they go slower. But slower tends to be more comfortable and better. If you're in the non-contact mode with the non-contact head, you want to be one to three inches away. So both are one to three, right? One to three inches away and one to three inches per second still in a grid-like pattern. Remember that you cannot treat through any bandaging material or casting material or clothing. You know, some light is getting through, but we have no idea how much it is. So uh, again, if you're, say, treating a non-union fracture, you need to have a cast, uh, a window cut into the cast, or you need to have the splint off to treat that area in order for the uh, dose to reach the um, tissue. Okay, a moment just to talk about some very basic uh, software issues. The best way to learn the software is just to navigate around in there um, on your own and see where it takes you, sort of like your iPhone. But when you get your laser, you want to go into the setup um, section first and pick the uh, volume of the beeping noise that you want and pick the finger switch on. Otherwise, you have to have that finger switch button held down when you're lasering, and that is very fatiguing. Uh, the aiming beam I usually have on constantly. The uh, sound that emits while the laser is emitting. Um, I have that on a beep rather than a tone because, again, it can be annoying, and I usually put it on the lowest volume setting. The other um, buttons that you have on here under the resources, you have a treatment guide and uh, also some before and after pictures of animals that have been treated, and you also have an anatomy uh, animation, so you could show a client, you know, I'm trying to treat the psoas, here it is, or I'm trying to treat the sciatic nerve, here it is, uh, on this particular animal. Um, the patient tracker function allows you to enter uh, the patient's name and parameters, and then each subsequent time, um, you don't have to re-enter all that information, so it's a much faster way to uh, get the patient entered and then to record all of its treatments over time. When you want to export uh, those treatments, you can hit the print record button, put a USB um, into the back, and it will export the uh, PDF file to the USB um, when you hit print. So that's sounds a little funny, it says print, but it really exports the, uh, exports the PDF when you ask it to print. The operation uh, mode will let you uh, select all the parameters yourself. So you select the power that you want to use, the time that you want to use, and that will give you the total number of joules. Um, and that's different than protocols. In protocols, you're going to pick the condition that you want to use, and that's going to give you a number of joules to treat that condition with. Once you have the condition, you can adjust the number of watts, which will just the amount of time. So as you go for more watts, you get less time, or as you go for less watts, you get more time. So again, it's the total number of joules that is administered to any specific area that we need to record and that we need to be most conscientious of because that is really the dose that we're giving um, to the area.
area that we're trying to treat. It's a little difficult to show you on this interface, you know, with this iPad format, these different things, but we do have um, some specific videos that show that a little more clearly. And really, this is the easiest part is navigating um, software, but I did want to talk about at least the setup function and uh, where the major paths that the buttons um, take you are. So the operation mode, just as an example, if I wanted to treat my knee because there's not a human setting in here, you know, I would measure about four handfuls. I wanted to use 10 joules per square centimeter. That'd be about 4,000 joules. So I would say, okay, well, I'm going to treat myself at, um, let's say, 14 watts, and I would increase the time until I saw um, four or 5,000 joules come up in the uh, total of the treatment. And you can use that analogy for any um, other area that you're trying to treat. I also like you to know that in the software, there's several paths to the same answer. So um, and we will show you this, but if you wanted to treat uh, a fracture or if you wanted to depict the arthritis setting, those are both deep pathologies that are going to be treated at about 10 joules per square centimeter. So um, again, there's, there's several ways to get to the same answer. Um, it just tries to give you as easy a path to get to an answer as possible. And so again, um, you might get there several different ways. If you pick to treat, you know, dermatitis versus otitis, they're both superficial conditions, so you're going to get a similar dose for a similar area for either one of those conditions. Okay, um, let's take one more break. We're going to talk about the uh, iPad and laser liaison instrument. Again, it's very hard for me to show you how to navigate um, through the iPad here, but I want to at least um, give you a little introduction and insight into um, how we use the iPad. So I think one of the um, remarkable differences between uh, this piece of equipment and most of the other ones that you see in this clinic or in your clinic is that um, it's not just a piece of equipment that arrives in a box and you got to figure out how to use it. And we're going to train you, you have access to webinars, to YouTube videos, to Aimla training, and to your iPad. Your iPad has uh, three main functions on it that you're going to be exploring. The laser liaison app, uh, the photo app, and um, iBooks. Those are the three that I use the most. So the laser liaison app Again, there's a self-guided tour to that on there, but I mostly like to go into the staff materials and explore those different um, subtitles there. And there's several uh, good things in there as far as training your staff goes, training yourself, or training your clients. Uh, the medical animation video of laser therapy is one that I use all the time. Um, I actually have it in the waiting room to explain to people. So uh, everybody has their favorite um, aspects of the uh, laser liaison app they like to use, but that's one of my favorites. Dr. Arza um, has a training um, module that's very similar to this YouTube video um, that you can uh, listen to somebody else, give you another take on how to use the laser. Um, there's several presentations in there, so if you need to go to your local Rotary Club or your local kennel club, or if you want to give your staff uh, a tune-up on um, what laser therapy does and how it does it, you can just plug the iPad into a projector um, and you're off to the races without having to do a lot of homework or um, you know, outside research for that. There's also access to several uh, videos and papers, direct links to uh, AIMLA training, to the clinician's corner, and to the companion website. So again, I think it's like your iPhone. I mean, I can uh, explain to you how to use your iPhone, but really the best way to learn it is to use it and just explore, go back and forth, find out what parts of it um, you like the best. The photo application, um, I like to tell everybody it's important to um, Used in a couple different ways. One is get a picture of all of your patients with the dials on and immediately send that to the owner. The owner will send it to 20 of their friends, guaranteed. It will market your practice better than any advertising that I've ever paid for, any other marketing that I've been able to figure out for my practice. So take advantage of that. That first visit takes a little bit longer when you get the picture with the dials, but it's really cute and um, owners just really flip about it. So make sure you do that every patient, every time. Um, also take a picture of any wounds before and after and as you're going along so you can create your own therapy guide or put some of these um, before and after cases on your website or your Facebook um, page. And similarly with your lameness dogs, take a five or six second video. Those are e emailable and easy to send over the uh, internet and it gives you a visual representation of how the animal is responding to the laser um, therapy over time. So. Um, again, those take a small investment in time, maybe one or two minutes um, to have these before and after photos, but um, really try to be good about doing that because, um, again, I think the dividend that that 
paid back is very high. The other uh, function that I like to use is iBooks. Um, so in the iBooks, you can put any PDFs that you like, pictures or uh, letters of recommendation or articles that we're giving you or therapy guides. And um, I just like that interface. I think it's very elegant and fast. And sometimes um, when I'm looking at different things within the laser liaison, it's an extra step to get into. So again, you may have some redundancy. Some things will be in the laser liaison app that are also in the iBooks uh, function. But um, those are the three aspects of, that I really like to use. The other thing I'll tell you is that um, the iPad has a much bigger impact on clients than just a camera with a small screen. This big picture really uh, seems to bring messages home. So you can even use it for dentals and other you know, non-laser uh, type applications. And I think um, get some you know, remarkable and good um, results from that as well. Um, the laser liaison also comes with uh, access to uh, Diane Miller, who's an MBA that works exclusively for us. And um, we'd be happy to answer any questions specifically about uh, economics or marketing or the business aspect. Um, and I, again, will tell you what's worked for me in my clinic and uh, what um, I found successful as well. Okay, that's it. Your uh, iPad is going to come with a, a little folio. I find it a little awkward. I really like these outer box covers. Um, they're pretty bulletproof as far as dropping, especially in the clinic um, setting. So get yourself an outer box cover. Also, if you uh, believe in Apple Care, which I think is a good thing, um, you can purchase that for your iPad. I think you have 30 days to get it once your um, iPad arrives. So those are the only two things that I can think of uh, that you specifically uh, need as far as operating the laser. Uh, maybe the Costco dog bed or something to make the room comfortable. Um, but otherwise, you're going to be pretty completely outfitted uh, with the laser um, package that you get from us. Um, so I think, uh, I think that wraps up most of what you need to know uh, to you know, effectively apply the laser in a safe fashion, get good results, explain it to uh, your clients as they're in the room. And really, what I tell people is have a little patience with yourself. It's going to take 10 uh, treatments to sort of get over the first jitters or nervousness. It's going to take 100 treatments to be an expert. And uh, when you've done a thousand treatments and that won't take that long, uh, you'll be as good as anybody who's out there. So I think it's a lot easier than um, dentistry, let's say, but um, it's similar in the way that it's doctor prescribed and technician administered. It's a really fun way to develop your practice. If you get good at this and you think that this is uh, valuable, then consider some of these other things that you can um, do to enhance your training or to enhance your um, therapy that you're providing these animals. So about your know, cold therapy, passive range of motion, maybe getting your CCRP training at University of Tennessee. Uh, Daryl Nulse's handbook on canine rehabilitation is really helpful. And I don't mean to leave cats out, but uh, most of the focus is on dogs, and most of the information is applicable um, to cats and exotics and horses. But again, the majority of the um, information that's been published is for dogs. So in any case, uh, I think that every practice uh, should have laser therapy and will have laser therapy. Eventually, we all should be doing rehabilitation. Um, the laser is a great anchor for that service, and I think that you can uh, make yourself very valuable to your practice if you are a good laser technician and if you can um, bring some of these other uh, knowledge and uh, techniques to the table as well. Okay, and you're going to have a lot of uh, resources to access. Um, we will provide you with a checklist and an explanation of the checklist, which will explain all of these things that uh, we've been going through in this video in detail, so you can have a uh, written resource to review. But uh, be aware that uh, there is several more uh, places to get more training. So there's Companion University, there's your AIMLA tuitions, uh, which arrived with your laser um, to give you race qualified CE towards your uh, RDT, LDT, or DVM uh, licensing. Uh, there's a clinician's corner, there's YouTube webinars, uh, there's companion webinars, um, and uh, again, I think if you go to any uh, major CE conference, you'll find that there is uh, lectures on laser therapy and uh, rehab and pain management that um, will reinforce this information that um, I've tried to present to you here today. So this is, uh, again, sort of a fundamental um, introduction. It's not uh, meant to be uh, exhaustive or by any means, but it is, mean, it is meant to give you at least some uh, basic understanding of uh, how the laser works, how to apply it, 
and uh, you know how to get started. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to show you one other area here. Let's pick pyotraumatic dermatitis. And really, this could be for any kind of dermatitis. And you'll see that you get a graph here of the area that you want to treat. Now, just remember, this graph is in inches, and it's not the size of the wound or the area that you want to treat, but it's the size of the wound or the area plus the normal appearing tissue beyond the margin of the area that you want to treat. So if you had, uh, you know, uh, a wound that was, say, two by three, you might pick the three by four or three by five uh, treatment area and then hit the next button. And again, this will tell you uh, for the selection that you made what uh, treatment it wants you to give 432 joules to that area. And again, that makes sense if you remember 100 square centimeters at four joules per square centimeter is going to be about 400 joules. So uh, that's making sense. I can hit the max button here. I can also adjust the dial up or down and my dose does not change. I'm going to quickly show you otitis. So when you pick otitis, it asks you for the size of the pinna and the external ear canal. And again, I always err on the side of slightly larger. Hit the next button. And again, this one is going to take you through two treatment areas. So here, treatment area of one or two, three by four. And this is condition otitis superficial. So you're going to use the non-contact head for that. When you're done, it's going to say you're done with area one. Go to area two. And a lot of these will be bilateral treatments. So again, you just repeat the treatment for the other side and the other ear. You'll have to switch um, treatment heads twice during that time as you go um, from superficial to deep each time. Okay. The last one I want to show you is uh, stomatitis. Again, this is a two-part treatment. So when I hit stomatitis, it's going to ask me if I want to do the mouth open or closed. And typically, I'll do the open mouth treatment. Um, and then I'll complete that treatment, and I'll go back in a second time. I'll select the closed mouth treatment. So I do all my stomatitis or gingivitis from both directions, basically the open mouth uh, non-contact and then the closed mouth contact uh, direction. And still in this position, I always hit the max button. If I wanted to turn my laser up or down a little bit to change the treatment time, I can. But you can see these treatment times are relatively uh, short for the superficial, and you'll get up to somewhere around two minutes for the deep um, treatment time. So those are a little more unusual, the ear and the uh, mouth treatments, in that there's a superficial and a deep um, treatment for both of those options. All right, I'm going to quickly show you the operation mode. So in the operation mode, you can select all the parameters yourself. Say I wanted to deliver 4,000 joules of energy at 12 watts. So I'm going to turn my power up to 12 watts. A little bit too far there. And then I'm going to increase my time until I can get to my uh, total of 4,000 joules, which is over here. So let me see, a little bit more, a little bit more. There we go. So 4,320 joules. So that's how I would do a treatment in operation mode. Now, operation also has a mode that's new to this laser called perfect protocol. And so this does, um, again, some of the thinking for you. You can see this little box up here you can hit. And then in this box, uh, you can pick these parameters and it will calculate a dose. So let's say I'm treating, um, my knee that I calculated as being 400 square centimeters because it was four handfuls or four <laughs> three by five cards. And I want to treat that at 12 watts. Um, and I want to deliver a certain amount of energy per uh, square centimeter. So let's say in this case I want to deliver 15 joules per square centimeter. Um, and then again, I can pick my coat color down here as medium, dark, or light, and my skin color because that's going to affect my wavelength blend. And then I can hit my calculate button, and it will get, give me a dose. So it's telling me for that area, it wants me to give 6,000 joules. Um, power 12, uh, time is um, 8 minutes and uh, 20 seconds, and um, I'm off to the races. So it's a third way to come up with a dosage without having to um, calculate it yourself, as long as you know uh, which parameters you want to use. And I consider this a fairly advanced setting. Once you've used the laser for a couple months, then maybe you'll be ready to go to this setting. But it does require more knowledge of the laser, the therapy, the dose that you want to deliver. But this perfect protocol um, operation mode is another um, new aspect that um, will really allow you a lot of flexibility and um, specification for each individual patient. Okay.